hello everyone uh, welcome back to my channel in this video tutorial i'll be talking about mammalian fertilization and uh, this is the first part of uh, this mammalian fertilization video series and in this video i'll try to emphasize more on the sperm capacitation part and in the coming parts i'll try to focus on uh, other things like uh, the chemotaxis and the recognition of zona pellucida proteins and uh, the gamete fusion the genetic material fusion and those kind of things but in this video i'll give a brief overview and i'll try to focus on the sperm capacitation part so to begin with the first thing that you need to know is the mammalian fertilization unlike the uh, invertebrate fertilization uh, for example, I talked about sea urchin fertilization, right? That was external fertilization. But the mammalian fertilization in almost all the cases is internal. Is internal. And as the name suggests, the internal fertilization takes place inside the body of the part participating pair. Right? So, for that reason, it is little difficult. Uh, in uh, order, uh, it is little, it is little difficult for us uh, to study the mammalian fertilization because it is taking place inside the body, right? In case of ex in case of external fertilization, as the fertilization is taking place outside, you can easily replicate the outside environment. For example, let's say the fertilization is taking place in seawater, so you can take the salt salty seawater and you can artificially create a system where you can. Uh, perform the fertilization study but in case of internal fertilization it is comparatively difficult to replicate an internal environment because for in order to do so you need to know all the factors um, that are involved in order to create that exact internal environment right and there is another thing that you should know is for example i'll cite the example of human in this case uh, in case of each uh, ejaculation around 280 to 10 to the power 6 sperms are released okay sperms released each time and among this 280 in 20 to the power 6 sperms only about 200 reach the vicinity of the egg the vicinity of egg so as you can see the chances are less than one in a million so if you are watching this video you can consider yourself comparatively lucky because uh, well you are quite special it seems so right anyway uh, moving on in case of uh, mammalian fertilization, the basic structure or the basic morphology of the mammalian egg is little bit different from that of uh, invertebrate oocyte. The basic difference is in case of in case of um, mammalian egg, the egg membrane is covered by a layer or an envelope known as zona pellucida all right and this zona pellucida is further covered by a matrix okay and that matrix is known as cumulus cumulus and this cumulus uh, matrix is nothing but an accumulation of the ovarian follicle cells right so the basic physiology is that the egg and the cumulus complex this gets uh, recognized by the oviduct there are certain projections known as fimbri in the oviduct and that uh, recognizes this egg plus cumulus complex so if art you artificially remove this outer matrix this 
egg solely won't be recognized okay so you need both of them okay uh, next i'll give you a pic i'll show you a picture basically of the female reproductive system so you get a better idea better visual idea uh, and that will help you to understand the next parts of this lecture so hope you are able to see this picture this is from the book of developmental biology by gilbert so this is the uterus as it is point out and this is called the oviduct or the fallopian tube in case of humans those two terms you can use interchangeably and this is the ovary where the development of the oocy oocyte is taking place and these are those fimbri so as you can see here it is showing the ovulation ovulation taking place and this oocyte along with its outer matrix which i just mentioned is called cumulus is accepted and the sperm enters through here through the vagina and then it has to go all this way and in this later portion of uh, the ampulla you can say infundibulum as it is mentioned here so here the fertilization takes place right so the sperm comes and here is the oocyte along with its cumulus and the sperm has to penetrate that outer matrix and it has to then uh, fuse with this egg and then the fusion of the genetic material will take place and it will form the zygote right and it will then develop and get implanted in the uterine wall right so that is the whole basic idea now another thing i'll mention here that we all know the sperm has the motility right sperm is highly motile in nature but that motility is not enough for the sperm to reach here because it is quite far and uh, a particular sperm cell to reach from here to here it takes around 30 minutes and uh, that time might seem pretty long but if you if you actually consider the size of a sperm cell and the distance that it needs to cover uh, to reach from uh, the vagina to the this particular portion in the oviduct uh, it should take uh, quite longer than that and there are some sperms that reach here as fast as uh, in just 30 minutes so how sperm does it so the answer is that not only the sperm motility the, i mean the flagellar movement of the sperm aids in its movement through the female reproductive system but also the ovarian muscular contraction along with the ciliary movements aid um, in that um, particular journey and that is quite important and you should remember that all right so the first point is the uterine muscle contraction helps in sperm movement right and also one other thing that you should know is the particular region I talked about right in uh, in the while I was talking about the physio physiology and showing you the picture I hope you remember that oh, sorry um, it's not ampulla it's ampulla yeah so ampulla right in the later part of this ampulla the fertilization takes place and it's not that the sperm directly reach that particular location the sperm it enters the oviduct and before it reaches that particular location in the ampulla where fertilization is taking place so before reaching i mean this later part of the ampulla okay the infundibulum you can keep that in mind before reaching the the site of ampulla i mean by this 
site, I mean the site of fertilization, the sperm is the sperm is slowed down. And this is really important because the slowing down helps the sperm to buy some time in order for it to get matured or to get capacitated. Capacitated. Right? Keep this term in mind. This we'll come across this again in this video a lot. And I'll talk about this in, in, in just few moments. And another thing, another thing that in the vicinity of uh, the oocyte, the sperm gets hyperactive, right? And it's natural. And from what, what we have learned uh, while studying the sea urchin fertilization is that with the help of chemotaxis, uh, the sperm locates the egg, right? And same takes place here also. And apart from chemotaxis, thermotaxis is also there to help the sperm to navigate its way through the ovarian tract. So. Thermotaxis plus chemotaxis. And we'll discuss uh, this particular uh, stages in the later videos. Okay. And there are another thing that you should uh, understand by this point is that throughout this journey from the vagina to the ampulla the sperm matures and this maturity is really really important and this course of sperm maturation aided by certain physiological events certain certain signaling pathways and certain cues is known as capacitation okay so sperm capacitation So this is basically the process by which sperm gets competent or it earns the competence, it achieves the competence, competence, competent to do what? Competent to fertilize egg, fertilize egg and unless it achieves this com competence, it cannot fertilize egg and it cannot undergo the acrosomal fusion. So, if this competence does not occur, not occur, then the acrosomal reaction, the acrosomal reaction cannot take place, right? It cannot take place. So, basically in the oviduct, the sperm is held captive, right? Or it is slowed down so that it does not reach the egg really really fast and it uh, manages to buy some time in order for it to get matured or get capacitated and then packets of sperm which are capacitated is released from the pre -amp region okay it makes sense right it is slowed down it is allowed to mature and then packets of it are released which can potentially fertilize the eggs or the egg I mean I should say egg I should not say eggs right now there are basic steps in which capacitation take place so capacitation steps
the first thing that you should keep in mind is the sperm cell membrane is full of lipid rafts right sperm cell membrane full of lipid rafts lipid rafts and what lipid rafts are made of they are made of sorry cholesterol now oviduct contains albumin a lot of it and this albumin is an absorber of cholesterol so it absorbs cholesterol right so the cholesterol a lot of cholesterol is effluxed from the sperm cell membrane so the cholesterol is effluxed pardon my handwriting i hope you are able to understand it so this cholesterol is effluxed right and this efflux in uh, this efflux in cholesterol result in uh, results in the accumulation or the clustering of the lipid rafts near the sperm head so this efflux results in clustering of rafts near the sperm head okay near the head near the sperm head now another thing that you should keep in mind is you should keep in mind is that uh, during this capacitation a lot of carbohydrate carbs and proteins are removed from the sperm cell membrane removed from cell membrane and there is a reason why this is done because lots of carbohydrates and proteins have been found to mask to mask certain receptors which are present on those lipid rafts right so this 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 lipid rafts it contain receptors hope you are able to say it it contains receptors and lots of these receptors are masked and lots of these receptors are masked by these carbohydrates and proteins and these carbohydrates and proteins are removed during capacitation so those receptors are unmasked and these receptors these receptors they um they recognize zona pellucida proteins okay and it has also been suggested that this efflux of cholesterol somehow results in the removal of this carbohydrates and proteins so that unmasking of these receptors can take place and zona pellucida can be recognized from uh, by the sperm by the capacitor sperm so to speak all right then moving on to the third step the third step of the sperm capacitation pathways uh, through the course of this capacitation or during this capacitation uh, there is opening of potassium channels right so the potassium is also effluxed okay and this potassium efflux results in hyperpolarization hyperpolarization of the sperm cell membrane right and this hyperpolarization means means uh, lowering in the membrane voltage right it it becomes highly negative it becomes highly negative and this lowering in voltage results in opening of calcium channels so the calcium ions they come in calcium influx takes place and if you remember uh, while talking about the ch in fertilization i mentioned calcium a lot and uh, if you have watched that video then you will know that calcium influx is really really important when it comes to the, comes to fertilization and the mammalian fertilization is also 
no exception and here also calcium uh, ions are really important okay so this cholesterol efflux this cholesterol efflux along with this hyperpolarization it aids in opening of another channel another channel which is known as nbc this is basically uh, a sodium bicarbonate uh, exchanger and this particular channel helps in the influx of bicarbonate ions bicarbonate ions okay and this together with the calcium ions they activate they activate a special type of adenylate cyclase uh, enzyme you can call it the soluble adenylate cyclase enzyme and this adenylate cyclase helps in the conversion of amp to camp camp cyclic amp and the cyclic amp results in the activation of protein kinase a which in turn activates the protein tyrosine kinases and inactivates phosphatases thus and then protein tyrosine kinase then mediates tyrosine phosphorylation right and then activates certain proteins which are essential when it comes to the sperm capacitation activation of proteins and this helps the sperm to achieve capacitation right so this is in general how capacitation is taking place right with the help of hyperpolarization as well as this cholesterol efflux which is uh, basically which is basically uh, influencing the membrane permeability so uh, with the help of these two factors this bicarbonate as well as calcium ions are coming in and they are activating adenylate cyclase which is helping in conversion of amp to cyclic amp i'm sorry which is resulting in the activation of protein kinase a which is resulting in the activation of protein tyrosine kinase and which is activating proteins that is helping in achieving capacitation right and there are certain proteins that are activated through this pathway and one of those proteins are a pair of basically heat shock proteins or hsps hsps they get activated and the this phosphorylated hsps they move to the cell membrane where they access proteins that recognizes uh, zona pellucida proteins or zona pellucida surface markers all right okay next i'll talk about few other things uh, related to this internal signaling pathways that is now i just talked about pka right that gets activated through that adenylate cyclase pathway so this pka it causes the sperm motility the sperm motility to increase and it also results in something called hyperactivation motility or ham right and this is basically nothing but nothing but asymmetric flagellar beating and this helps in uh, effective penetration of zona pellucida effective z zona pellucida penetration all right and another thing that you should know is you know is through the course of sperm capacitation 
phospholipase C gamma also gets activated. And that phospholipase C gamma, as you know, results in the activation of IP3 and DAG, which results in the formation of protein kinase C. And this protein kinase C, I'm sorry, is also really, really important in sperm capacitation. And this protein kinase A, this protein kinase A, this basically in inactivates the protein kinase C. And this does it uh, by inactivating uh, probably the phospholipase C. All right. So that's how the protein kinase A and protein kinase C basically regulate each other. But you need to know that both of these uh, two proteins are really important in sperm capacitation. And if you artificially uh, knock out protein kinase A or protein kinase C, the sperm capacitation, the sperm motility, these things will get hampered. Also, with the help of co-immunoprecipitation studies, it has been found that PK, protein kinase A or PKA, it co-immunoprecipitates with the SRC family of uh, protein kinases. Okay? These two, they co-immunoprecipitate together. So, there might be uh, certain co uh, certain um, interregulation that is going on in between these two and which is indeed the case now i will basically talk about a little bit more in detail of the signaling pathways and i'll talk about it in three different stages the first one is the beginning of capacitation right the beginning of capacitation sorry the beginning And in this stage, what you need to know is the NBC receptor, which causes the bicarbonate influx, along with cat spur. This is basically cationic uh, channels of sperm cell membrane, and this causes uh, the calcium influx. So these two gets activated, and HCO3 levels as well as calcium levels go up right and this causes as i have mentioned previously the activation of the soluble adenylate cyclases which results in the activation of protein kinase a right and later on the uh, cholesterol cholesterol removal is also taking place right and that is also resulting in the activation of this particular pathway right next what you need to know is the protein kinase a i said it co-immunoprecipitates with src kinases right so basically this protein kinase a has been found to activate src kinase through phosphorylation obviously and this this particular step is really important why i'll just tell you now now as you know there is acrosomal vesicle right near the sperm head and there is the sperm cell membrane like this and then there is the whole sperm head and the tail right right and in bit in the in, in between uh, the sperm cell membrane and the acrosomal membrane there is the space right and in this particular space there is a network there is a network of actin molecules in between this space and this fibrous actin molecule network basically prevents the acrosomal fusion right because in order for the acrosomal vesicle to fuse with the sperm cell membrane this actin network needs to uh, be degraded and this degradation then uh, clears up this uh, path and the vesicle fuses with the membrane and the inner materials are released so the outer um, coverings of the oocyte can be digested and then the gamete fusion can take place and this src kinase activation it basically helps in 
the inactivation of a particular very important factor known as gelsolin which remains bound with PIP2 this gelsolin basically helps in the disintegration of the polymerized actin okay so this as long as this src kinase uh, levels are up with the help of the activation uh, mediated by this protein kinase this, this gelsolin will remain inactive so this fibrin network that is there in between the cell membrane and the acrosomal membrane remain intact so this fusion uh, won't be possible right this is uh, as uh, you should know i mean i hope you remember we are talking about the beginning part of the sperm capacitation now at this stage the protein kinase c alpha is also active and this helps in the activation of a phosphatase known as pp1 gamma 2 and obviously this activation is mediated by phosphorylation all right phosphorylation takes place and this activation of this phosphatase this phosphatase basically keeps the pi3k inactive with the help of its inherent phosphatase activity right so pi3k is inactive now i just talked about pip2 right it it is uh, bound to this gelsolin now this pip2 pip2 also plays a role in the activation of pld which is basically phospholipase d and this phospholipase d causes the activation of phosphatidic acid and this phosphatidic acid is uh, the molecule that causes the co conversion of G actin to F actin. So this is the molecule that helps in the polymerization of actin and this is the molecule that helps in breaking down the polymerized actin, right? So, and this all steps are taking place at the beginning portion of the capacitation reactions now now i'll talk about the ongoing steps of the capacitation what happens there so the ongoing part at this stage something really interesting happens the PKA I just talked about, which gets activated through that cyclic AMP pathway, that PKA it mediates, it mediates proteosomal degradation of PKC alpha as well as PP1 gamma 2. All right. Now, if you remember what these two molecules do is, what these two proteins do is, it helps in keeping PI3K inactive. All right. Now, the PI3K can get activated because these two are degraded okay and also another thing at this stage the calcium levels are also quite high because because the calcium channels are getting open right and this protein kinase a that is getting activated that also helps in the uh, elevation of this calcium levels through the opening of the calcium channels along with that a partial activation of EGFR is also taking place at this stage and these two helps in the elevation of PI3K at this stage 
right but that gel solene i talked about if you remember the gel solene that helps in disintegrating this fibrous actin network that is occupying the space in between the cell membrane and the acrosomal membrane that gel solene is still uh, inactivated with the help of this src kinase so the acrosomal fusion still cannot take place right now we will move into the final part the final section and this or maybe i'll go into the next page so this final part can be called the acrosomal reaction part all right and at this final stage of capacitation the calcium levels are really high the egfr is fully activated right and pi3k is active the plc gamma the phospholipase c gamma levels are also active right and protein kinase a that is getting activated through through the camp pathway that is also facilitating the activation of this pi3k and this plc we all know what it does right it it basically degrades the pip2 into ip3 plus dag and also if you remember correctly that pi3k that used to be inactivated is now fully active as it was in the ongoing stage as well and this plc is also cleaving the pip2 right so now now the pip2 levels are low and if you remember properly the gel solene the gel solene that was there bound to the pip2 is now free because the pip2 levels are going down so now the free gel solene now can now can cleave the polymerized actin right now the network is destroyed so now the acrosomal fusion can take place so this is what marks the end of the sperm capacitation stages so hope you understood all of this and hope you like this video in the next parts i'll try to talk about the later portions in the mammalian fertilization process and till then uh, i hope you will be uh, watching other videos that i have uploaded so far i have uploaded only two uh, not many and i'll try to keep uploading as i keep studying these things and if in any way this video helped you learn then please hit like don't forget to subscribe uh, if you have any suggestions and any corrections then please uh, write those in the co comment section uh, let me know what do you think about these videos and i'll see you in the next video uh, till then bye bye and have a very nice day